Well, I got wiped out by a terrible migraine yesterday, or I would have done a stream. So I'm picking up today on Tuesday. Uh, you can sort of see I've added a few new things um, that weren't there the last time. As I move around different maps. <coughs> Excuse me. I showed you guys how I did the overlays and static and all that. Um, I've added storms. Let me actually get out of that. Restart that. Mostly in the last video, uh, I've been working on weather hazards, different um, different oops, different things for the rover and the crew to encounter when they're exploring planets, and did some overlays. Also, I need to take that out. That value is not really important right now, but it's going to keep showing up. See, I've added all the particle effects and overlay effects and stuff. New one here is wind that pushes against the rover. It actually moves a little bit quicker if it's moving with the wind, but if you just let go of the controls, it'll just keep pushing you in the direction of the wind. Uh, that's actually a pretty simple, uh, simple effect. There's a couple ways to do it, depending on your needs. Um, let me just pull up my desert. Flip through my layers so it doesn't look as crappy. There's actually a couple different ways you can do a wind effect, and you can use these built-in events, the slide or the push. Both of them work pretty similarly. I'm not really 100% sure <laughs> of the difference, to be 100% honest with you guys. I couldn't really tell you exactly. One has a duration and a distance, and one has a velocity and a duration. So slide will slide by a certain distance for a certain amount of time, and push pushes by a certain speed for a certain amount of time, or a certain velocity by a certain amount of time. Now, uh, the effect is almost exactly the same. I can't really tell the difference, but you would basically just set it up so this runs inside a timer. Um, I'm actually using a really slow timer. I think it's at 035, yeah. Really slow timer, and you can use a push or a slide and just give it a very small distance. Um, the problem I've run into with these is the, the way that collisions work in 001, I'm not 100% certain what is inside these events, the math. I'm not sure what math is going on here, I don't know. But for some reason when I use these in top-down perspective, or if I use these uh, with my current setup, I kind of get stuck on walls. Sometimes if the, the power of the slide or push event is too strong, it actually kind of gets stuck and you can't move. And it has nothing to do with the speed being too high. It actually just gets stuck because it's touching something. And so I've made a different version of that that uses variables. And you can change the values. Uh, I've got a wind strength variable to tell us how strong the wind is blowing because there isn't a strength variable inside 001. You just have a 001 has a wind um, direction, like a, there's a little wheel if you go into the map environment settings, there's a little wind direction dial that you can set and you can change that with events and stuff, but there's no strength to the wind. The wind just determines the direction of the weather, really, the direction that your particles are falling and stuff, uh, or the clouds. So I have to make a wind strength variable, and the wind strength is just how strong it's blowing. And since the direction value of the wind is in radians, I believe, I don't know anything about math, so when I talk about math, I'm <laughs> I'm probably saying things wrong. I might be I might be off. I don't know. But uh it's in radians, I believe, and that means it's 
it goes from 0 to 3.14. It goes to 3.14 times 2. So the I think it's like 6 point something, 6.2. <coughs> it's a value between 0 and 6, I believe. And depending on which direction you're facing. Um, but in order to get the x, you just get the cosine of the direction. So I, I don't know why. I don't know math very well. I had to do a lot of Googling and reading to get some of this math into my brain over the years. So I know that I needed the cosine of the direction of the wind. So right now it's set to map, actor rover dot map, which uh, the map that the rover is currently on, it's checking the map dot wind value, which is this outer set of parentheses, and getting the cosine of that, and then multiplying that by my wind strength value. I do the same thing with the y, only instead of cosine, I'm just getting the sine. Uh, it's exactly the same thing, checking the map that the rover is on, the wind direction, and getting the sine of that, and multiplying it by the strength. I actually don't even need this one here anymore. I forget why I had that in the first place. Oh no, yes I do, just kidding. I thought I was, that was from an earlier script. So I have to get this value called a dot product. Um, it's kind of like cross multiplication, I believe, in some some way. You, you multiply the x values and then add them to the multiplied y values, which gives you this little tiny value between 0 and 1, I believe. Uh, that's like a direction value, sort of, I think, because these are called vectors. Anyone who has done programming or any worked with any programs like you know, in 3D and stuff, you probably know what vectors are. I probably know less than you do. So these are considered vectors. It's an x and y of the rover, multiplying that by the x and y of the wind. And that gives me a little tiny number that I subtract from the number one as my speed multiplier. And I can change the speed multiplier. Anything lower than one will make the wind like weaker. And anything between, I, I, I actually believe one is the highest. So anything between zero and one, it'll slow down the closer it gets to zero. And then I just check to see if I'm holding or the player's holding down the up button. And if it is holding up, I want to combine the actor's current movement or the rover's current movement with the wind speed and multiply it by the speed multiplier. Right now, it's, I, I've got it to set to divide by two um, just because it was kind of a strong wind. <laughs> I won't even show you because there's no reason to. Um, and when it's not moving forward, uh, just set the movement to the power of wind x or wind y. <coughs> Excuse me, there's a lot of dust in here. Uh, which means I should probably clean it tonight. So, this will make sure that the wind continues to push the rover in the direction that it's blowing, even if you're not moving around, but this one adds the movement to the wind speed. So you can use push and slide to move things around, but I've had issues with collisions, so I had to make my own. And that's what gives that effect when you're on a planet with wind like this. It'll just blow you in the same direction that it's pointing. So right now I've got it pointed to the west, sort of southwest-ish. So I actually scooted the planet closer because I got tired of flying over to it. <laughs> Do -do -do -do. Go to the desert. Yeah, since it's going kind of this direction, it'll just keep pushing the rover backwards. And you can see how it has to struggle to get up to speed first. When it's trying to go against the wind. And you can get up to speed by going towards the direction it's blowing, but then it fights against you as you move back towards it again. And it doesn't push you very fast. It's actually kind of limited. Um, I think it's pushing you the same speed that the rover actually tops out at, so it just kind of shoves it along. And interestingly, it'll still sort of... It doesn't really work well with ice, and I'm not going to have much windy ice planets, but if you put it on an ice world, um, 
it kind of messes with the way that the ice acceleration works. So I, I'd have to figure out another way to make the two of them work together. Because I, I actually have no idea. But if you put wind on this planet here, um, it doesn't blow you around on the ice. So what was I actually messing with earlier? Uh, I was checking out my overlays. I do want the sandstorms to have an overlay when you're in the desert. Sandstorms should kind of mess with the navigation. So I do want like the static. I don't know if I'm going to have this bright static. Because <coughs> that's kind of kind of obnoxious. So I've got this other layer, one that I made in the last video, that adds a black dark layer behind it. So the two of them can blend together and that looks much better, I think. And I might even actually come in and redo my frames. I, I don't know because it's the same width as the one that I'm using on the mini map, and I want them to be consistent, but I don't know if this is enough darkness. And see, I'm getting blown across the map. There will be, I'm hoping to add a boost, like a booster that you can use temporarily. It'll use energy or fuel or something when you use it, but I'm hoping to add that as well. So I've got the, all these let me get out of this one. This massive list of hazards and objects and awful things. And my to-do list is just crazy huge. One thing that I did add was uh, shadow. I don't know if I got to cover the shadows properly. Um, That's easy to show, though. What day, what day did I do shadows? I don't remember. That was the 17th. So it was a couple days ago. I don't think I got to do the... Um, Yeah, I didn't get to do a video for my shadows yet. So, I can actually show you a little trick that I did here. Um, there's a quirk in 001 that uh, transparency has some issues showing things behind it. Uh, any, any sprites with transparency or 3D objects, for that matter. If you have a 3D object or a 3D model uh, that uses transparency, sometimes it can obscure the thing behind it. And I, I don't know why. It's just a rendering issue that's always present. It'll never go away. But you could do some cool stuff with it, which when I drive into the water, you can sort of see that it does look like I'm actually driving into the water and the graphics starts to fade out. It is because I, I am using a 3D model for the rover. It might look like a little 2D graphic, but it's a 3D rover, uh, just viewed from top down. It's using really simple like pixel art textures, so it blends in really well. I do have to redesign it, but you can see when it goes into the water, it gets kind of obscured. And then there's a shadow that follows it around and these little bubbles. The bubbles are gonna indicate that the people inside are drowning, I believe. Um, <laughs> right now, I was just testing the bubble effect earlier to just so I could see where the rover was, but you couldn't tell what direction the rover is facing. So I had to add this little shadow. This helps orient what you're doing when you're underwater, and it does look a little bit better because of the shadow layer moving into place, which I'll explain here. Since it's a 3D object, kind of goes transparent when it's behind another another layer, but we go in here, look at it from the top, actually let's look at it from the 3D view, you zoom in really really close, change the background, you can see underneath the rover, 
There's a little transparent shadow layer. It's not exactly the same. Uh, I kind of threw it together. It's almost exactly the same shape as the rover. You can't see it from above, really. And that's all the way down here. It's got its transparency set to 96, so it's kind of in line with the built-in shadows, almost. I just drew a flat, normal shadow for my rover. But the difference between just having it underneath the rover, if, if I just left it there where the rover is um, and didn't do what I'm about to do, it would just go underwater with the rover and the effect wouldn't look right. So on this layer, you actually have to use graphic scripting. And this is a long line, so I'll cut it or copy it and put it over here. So you can see it. Now, whenever you're using graphic scripting, this is something I, I know I might have failed to mention before, but in order to retrieve anything about an actor that's using the sprite, so like say you so you set up um you set up an actor and you give it this rover sprite, you want to use the relate um, type or relate actor type here. It'll that'll make it so you can retrieve information about the actor that's using this sprite. You can't say actor this or it'll fire an error. So use actor relate, and I want to check to see if the actor that's using this sprite, which will be the rover, if the actor Z position. Now that is the in and out or the up and down. So Y axis is vertical, the x-axis is horizontal, and the z-axis would be in and out of the screen. <coughs> Technically up and down. But if it's below zero, which means if it's under the map, I want to multiply this this layer's z position by negative one. Right now I've got set to an offset, or set to add an offset as well, but you don't have to. Um, I just did it so it kind of moves above the rover as it's going into the water. But what this does is it just takes the, the actor's Z position and flip-flops it so that the shadow moves upwards as the rover moves down. So when the rover moves down into the... Um, once it's down negative 32 underwater, it'll take this Z layer, which is at zero, and it'll move it to positive 32. So that'll put it right at the, the surface of the water. And I just gave it a little offset because I, I push it above the rover as it's going in so it slides up um, into place. It, it does this thing where, since this is transparent, it actually starts to turn the 3D model transparent. And that's just a weird quirk of 001. It's not an official feature, but you move something with transparency over the 3D model and it'll go transparent too. So I use that just to make it look like it's going into the water. I might even make a splash animation for that at some point. Not sure how I want to do a splash. I'd, I'd like to have some kind of indicator that is just splushed into the water. Splooshed. finally fixed my title screen interface to match the rest of the game. Entering factory orbit. Let's go into some water. Swoosh. Now I'd like to add the little splash right about there once the top gets submerged. I'll do some kind of splash or rippling effect. Still have all these little temporary turrets scattered around the map, and they'll shoot at you. But I did figure out how to get them to properly fire over water, which was an issue I was having. That was a stupid issue. They can't hit you if you're in the water, but they can hit you when you come back up. And I don't know why I didn't think about this before, but uh, since they're turrets, they can't move. But the setting to determine whether a projectile can go over water is not determined by the projectile. It's determined by the 
the actor and whether it can move over water. So I set the turret so that they can walk on water and that allows their projectiles to go over water. So at the moment I'm just using the built-in projectiles but I want to eventually switch to actor-based projectiles I think. I think. I've seen that there's an update coming that might add the ability to retrieve the positions and stuff of a projectile, but I don't know exactly what that update is or when it's coming or anything. So actor-based projectiles usually have more control. You can tell them what to do. You can have them spawn other things. You can make them move around. You can control the sprites, everything. Um, but the built-in projectile system is super convenient. So that's you just quickly piece together all the things you'd need like the impact graphics and the sound effects and to, like the statistics. So there's not a whole lot of super noticeable differences um, since the last time, but I sort of have to redo some of the graphics for those turrets. One thing I really need to do is sit down and properly design a whole bunch of my ships, which will take forever, but I'd like to do that off stream so I can come back with some stuff to show you. So let me see. It's a lot of small things, little fixes that uh, <laughs> it's mostly tedious little things that aren't super informative, but stuff that I still have to get done. I do have to add the different menus. There's a couple menus I still have to add. Oh, actually, oh, there's more than a couple menus, but the, some, some of the more important ones will be like the save menu or save game menu. So let me see if there's anything I can work on here. I'm still doing... Um, the weather system, mainly trying to figure out how I want to set it up to to reference. Oops, to reference the object that, or the planet that you're landing on, because right now this is just running because it's on a desert planet, but that shouldn't run if the climate's level isn't high enough. So uh, I'd have to check to make sure that the climate rating is high enough first, and I can do that. Pretty easily, just add that in here. Oh, I forgot to set up my commonly used events. So, actually, I want to find out <clears throat> the value of an actor variable of the currently selected actor. I want to check its climate rating. Make sure that it's greater than one. And if it is, then do the wind. <clears throat> so setting up this level system, uh, or climate rating, or hazard ratings, actually, I guess I should call them hazard ratings. Basically, every planet will have a level or strength of each hazard. That's the weather or climate. Climate determines the weather. Tectonics determines the um, earthquakes, spawning earthquakes and stuff. And then there's uh, radiation, which will be camera interference and damage. But actually, I just run this. It's gonna do this stupid thing really quick. But to show the the, the ratings on the side will change based on the planet that you're on. And right now, if I have it set to 1, there is no, no wind effect. Now, since it's in space, I want to change its climate rating here to 2. That'll immediately add this wind. Now. All I have to do is figure out a good way to increase or decrease the strength based on the climate rating of the planet. So 
I've got this wind strength variable set up in here. And right now the I think the cap or the top is 0 0.45. Now it's I'm I'm gonna struggle with the math for sure, but I want to be able to take the the climate value, which will be one through eight, and multiply it by a value so that one of my higher values is probably between four five and five five. Let me actually see if 5.5 five is too strong. the climate to the number two. So five five's not bad. Not too much. But I do want it to be noticeable between climate strength two and climate strength eight, so it's kind of tough. Uh, I'm not really certain. So 0 0.55 divided by 8. 0 0.6875. Hmm. Surface climate value, which will be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight. And I'm not really sure yet what number I'm going to multiply it by, but you know, if I did 0 0.6, 0 0.06 times 5 gives me 0 0.3, so that 0 0.06 times 8 gives me 48. Six five. So that'll be zero point zero six five times two. So the slow strength will be point one three one nine five. Okay, so I'll just have to test the different strengths. Um, it's possible I might just have to set up a multi comparison or condition that gives me manual values. But I want it to be able to increase or decrease the strength of the storm based on the, the climate rating. Entering planetary, orbit. Entering planetary orbit. So we'll give it a rating of 2. Which lightly pushes the rover, but still pushes it. So if we give it a rating of 5. Nice. So 2 is nice and slow. And 8 will just shove it as fast as it can. OK. 
Okay, so that's kind of nice. Oops. And down the lower levels, they'll still push against the rover because it does push. It's just not too strong. Though I do kind of, I could tweak that value a bit. I'm not really sure if that's exactly what I want. I'll say zero seven. <laughs> Since I'm dealing in really tiny numbers, testing and adjusting could be. Uh, just the most tedious part of this. Oh my gosh. Just to get it to feel right. I don't need it to be perfect right now, but just to attempt to make it a little bit more interesting than it already is. Um, climate. I'll set it to 2. I think I can click on it fast enough. So six really blows it. And then eight on max. Mm. Cool. Alright, so that works quite nicely. I actually might stick with that number for now, just because it's it's not too fast. It doesn't stop the rover from moving. That is noticeable, though. You can feel it when you try to push against it. One thing that I think would be interesting to add is the wind changing direction. I'm not 100% sure how I want to do that, but I do know that there's got to be a way. I want to actually try some math my friend sent me. I'm going to paste it over in one of my text files here. It's based on a, a drunken camera effect, so I actually want to try something else. Um, wonder placing my own variables. Because I don't really know what this value is for. But there's a way for me to create a swinging motion, but I'm not sure. I want to save that in my text file just in case so I can use it later to do some experimenting. But I'd like to make it so that the wind can kind of change direction and having a timer, I can have a timer that adds and subtracts the direction for the wind, but I also haven't really tried any other wind directions so let's say if I'm blowing the wind southward. Well, 
a little bit of work I have to do on my sandblast particles. There's they're, they're spawning and going in a certain direction, and I believe I know how to fix it, but I want to save that for another time. <coughs> I actually don't even know if you can see them moving sideways right now. But one of the hazards I can have is the wind changing direction, which will blow against the rover. It's actually kind of better than I was hoping for. It makes it a little tricky to get into some spaces sometimes. Sometimes it'll just push you right into the space you're trying to get into. Ah. I'll make it harder to get out. That's another bug I have to fix. Um, do is organize my tile sets in such a way that each biome is in their own tile set. <coughs> Things terraform with each other across different tile sets, but that way I can actually reference that this is a desert um, map using a desert tile set, and then I can replace these grass tiles with sand. Oh, there's so much to do. Do need to make more tile sets, which yikes. I'm not at all prepared. I have humans in the chat room. Let me change my climate rating here to five. Oops, I flip flop the planet. So right now the climate rating also has an effect on the strength of storms when you're on a terrestrial planet, which anything higher than a one will spawn lightning strikes. And I have actually gone through and fixed up the lightning just a bit. So now it's stretched out. It's going to spawn like crazy because we're on climate level five. Let me fix that. Climate level 2 is more appropriate for this. So that'll strike every so often on climate level 2. There's a small chance for a bolt to hit the rover directly. Um, I believe there's gonna, I'm going to do some upgrades for mitigating the damage for that, but in the beginning you can drive into water to hide from lightning strikes. It's an insulator, so you could hide in water. I'm going to set up some maps so they have little water patches that you can drive into and try and hide. But there's still always a chance that you'll get struck directly, which doesn't happen too often, but when there's a whole lot of lightning, you do get hit pretty frequently. There we go. And that'll shock the, the inhabitants of the rover, so anybody who's inside, or the passengers in the rover, anyone who's inside the rover will get zapped by the lightning bolt. So that's one hazard to dodge. Um, I think in the other video I made the lightning, they were very small bolts, and now they're really, really long. And the way I did that was just take the original graphic, uh, go to my effects here, my lightning strike. So the original graphic was a 64 pixel tall bolt. What I did with that is I doubled the height so that I can stretch it, but not stretch just this whole thing. Um, it's hard to explain. It's the same thing I do with the mining laser, but this lets me position it right at the center so that when I stretch it, this top part gets stretched upwards. This transparent part gets stretched downwards. So I can actually increase the uh, magnification of the Y-axis and stretch the bolt out 
and it doesn't really distort it that much. So it's basically just playing through these animation frames. I added a couple more. But then I combine it with um, a fade here. So if you look at the bolt as it goes through the frames, the very last frame, it fades out. It's actually supposed to fade out here, but I've also got it set up as a particle effect. So there's some movement on the y-axis where it moves upwards after it sh uh, shoots down. Not much, but you can see that it does have a fade out. Um, it spawns one time, and then I've kept the same sparks that we looked at when I made it last time. But all that does is make it so that it, it never spawns um, with the top it's hard to explain. <laughs> the bolt will never spawn so you can see the top of the bolt. It'll always be off the, uh, the camera due to the size. So the length of the bolt is beyond the edge of the camera field. In order to get it to spawn randomly everywhere, I have to add a loop. Let's, let's take a look at my loopy. I've moved my timers into the docking interface. I'm going to find a way to condense everything, but this is a, something I looked at in the last video, but it randomly picks a position around the rover and loops back, and then it gets a random time uh, to set the interval for the timer. It'll randomly change the interval of the timer by checking the climate rating. So that's going to be used for almost all of my randomly spawned weather hazards. Now this is the earthquake spawner and this is the lightning spawner. But I'd like to combine everything into one if I can. I'll find a way. There must be a way. And then there's going to be radiation clouds as well. So that's another disaster. The final thing I added to my earthquakes, something that's, I don't know if it's super useful, but you can use this in a lot of ways, like to throw a bomb and then detonate the bomb. Uh, I'll show you this effect. The first thing that happens is an earthquake warning, and you can see this little pulse. It's just a little white pulse, and the earthquake bursts which just erupts from the center, goes outwards. We've got these two parts. And they're set up as two actor templates. So the first thing that spawns is the earthquake warning. And the earthquake warning is this little pulsing sphere. And all I want this to do is show up for one second. It's gonna it, basically it's gonna warn the player that a tremor is about to spawn, and after one second, or this will run every one second. So after the first second, it will create another actor. It actually create. Oops. <laughs> It'll actually create the earthquake spawner, uh, the earthquake tremor that does damage, and then it will delete itself. So. I don't actually need any of these, but they're part of the parent. I'll have to deal with all this later, but it'll spawn this earthquake actor. And the earthquake actor, I've got a bunch of log messages and stuff in here I don't need. All that's doing is shaking the screen and playing an explosion sound effect. And I've got it set up to check whether it's colliding with anything. So right now it can affect and hit turrets. I don't know if I'm going to keep that, but depends on what kind of planets I design, but it's checking to see if it's colliding with the rover. <coughs> and right now I don't have any damage, but it'll flash the rover, it'll flash the actor that it's colliding with and spawn, um, or not spawn, when, once it erupts, it actually is supposed to deal damage within a nine tile radius, so. Those are spawned exactly the same way as the lightning bolts. Except lightning bolts 
cannot hit water. Lightning bolts can't hit water and they can't be positioned on top of walls. I might change the walls part. They might be able to strike on walls. But right now they can only strike the ground tiles, forest tiles and such. But they can't strike in water. Now I forgot to set a tectonics rating. Right now if it does, if an object doesn't have a tectonics rating, it'll just shut off the tectonics spawner. So let me change this tectonics to three. Say we scan the planet. Shows the hazard ratings over here. Level five for climate, level three for tectonics. So this will actually mean that there's going to be earthquakes and lightning everywhere. And you can see how they spawn. Um, these little warning bursts will appear first, and then a tremor actually happens afterwards. So you can drive straight through the warning dot. Oh, I got hit by lightning a million times. If only one would spawn near me. You can drive right through the warnings or the warning dot without getting hurt, but if you hit the, the tremor ring, it'll deal damage. But the difference between these and the lightning is lightning can't hit you when you're in the water, but these little tremors can. They can pop right on the edges they can hit you while you're underwater. You can't hide from them. It's just uh, physical damage. Now, if any of you think this looks kind of familiar, you're probably right. Um, you may have seen this before if you've ever played Star Control. They're kind of a homage to the, the Grand Masters of the space game, or space exploration game. One of the biggest games this one's influenced by, and two of the main hazards are lightning and earthquakes, but I wanted to do them in my own kind of way. So you see the lightning is going crazy here, and it does go crazy in Star Control, but you can't hide from it. And in this game, you'll be able to go underwater. You'll have different upgrades and stuff to protect yourself. But the earthquakes, they are almost functionally identical. They, they warn you first, and then they explode. Um, I think that's going to be kind of cool to have just this concept. And you could actually, oops, if I crank up the rating all the way, there are tons and tons. It'll spawn bunches and bunches of earthquakes, and it's really hard to get through some of the areas. So th this kind of thing will happen on rarer planets, more dangerous planets that you can, you can brave and try and work your way through. Of course, my crew would probably be dead at this point with no upgrades and stuff on the rover, but planets that have this kind of hazard rating will likely be much more lucrative. You'll find rare minerals and stuff. Oh, that's... I... It'll be much trickier with the wind, too. So all of these different forces, all these different um, weather conditions can combine. You can have wind and earthquakes and lightning and radiation clouds and, of course, on top of all of that, uh... I've got the overlays that add the, st the static and darkness interference to the map. So, you know, you'll f find yourself struggling to navigate these dangerous planets, these dangerous worlds, with tons of earthquakes and lightning and... Ah! Yeah, it's hard to see, but my frame rate is still well above what I would expect. 
uh, with this many things on screen at once. There's overlays and additive blending and actor spawning and particle effects and shaking screens and... Ah! Yeah, this would be a nightmare planet. Um, or considered a nightmare planet. You wouldn't want to land here. And if you did, there's probably something important there, or at the very least something valuable like radioactive minerals and whatnot. So yeah, that's all I've been working on, adding weather and hazards. Um, that's a couple different kinds. I want to go through my, my lists here, take a little bit of a break, figure out what to cover in the next video. But um, hopefully you got some ideas from a few of those tricks like adding wind that moves your actors or adding a force to the map. And you could use the same kind of thing to do stuff like gravity or simulating gravity even um, from a side view perspective, have wind that pushes the character back along a platformer. Just, you know, that in a lot of cases you can use the same types of mechanics in all kinds of different projects. So don't forget that like, just because this is a top-down game and the player is being blown around on screen doesn't mean you can't use this for something else in one of your own games. So, you know, if you're doing a platformer you, and you want wind to be blowing the player back on the screen, you know, this will work for that as well. This will work for most cases where you want some kind of wind effect. But I think that's all I'm going to do in this particular video. Let me just a bit to go through my stuff. Um, I'm actually working overnight tonight, so I've got a few things I have to do, but I'll be back on in a little bit. And as always, go to ScreamingBrainStudios.com if you haven't. Check it out. Check out all the free retro graphics. Everything's um, really old school, retro, totally, totally free, totally public domain, and there's all kinds of stuff, textures and backgrounds and tile sets and game pieces. I've got tutorials on how I make a lot of these. Not, there's not one for every single thing, but there's tutorials for all kinds of different graphics. So you can expand these packs or you can edit them. You can make your own. And then if you don't have any tools, I've got a list of free graphics tools, free noise generators, free texture tools, train tools, modeling tools, all kinds of free stuff that you can get here at ScreamingBrainStudios.com. As always, thank you guys for watching. Um, thank you for the support. Thank you for the comments. Uh, let me know if there's anything in particular that I could work on or should work on or that you are curious about or you might want to see. Um, and I'll try and cover it to the best of my ability. Until next time, hopefully uh, I'll have a little bit more for you than just some weather stuff. But take it easy.